And I will now like to introduce our next speaker to you. I would say he needs no introduction because you're already running his coach. Uh, but he might need an introduction since he's a new. Sorry, could I have some silence in the room, please? Thank you. You're already running his coach, and he's telling a story of which I am, for some reason, after running the Go Dev Room for five years, still I'm curious about because I haven't contributed to the Go project yet. And he has. I'm jealous of him. So a round of applause for a Go contributor. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Is the microphone in a good spot? Yep. So quick show of hands. Who here is a Go contributor? Has contributed to the standard library, the compiler? I see one, two, three, three, four. Shows hands, five. Who here would like to be, like Marcia, who would like to be a Go contributor? Oh, there's a lot more hands. Who of you who wants to be is afraid to become a Go contributor? Who thinks it's intimidating or complicated or you just don't know enough about Go routine scheduling or something like that? Okay. This talk is for you folks who have your hands up right now. So my goals for the talk, oh, my, first my agenda. I'm going to talk about goals, who I am, and uh, I'm going to tell my story of how I became a Go contributor and uh, talk a little bit about how you can too. That, so that, that's my goal. Um, my goal is today to tell my story and ultimately to encourage you to be less intimidated about becoming a Go contributor. My non-goals are to be exhaustive. I'm not going to do a deep dive into how the proposals work or how Garrett works or all the technical stuff. And I'm not going to show you a lot of code. There's a little bit of code, but you don't even have to be a Go developer to understand the code I'm going to show you. Who am I? Um, well, I am a Go contributor, <laughs> uh, technically. Um, I'm a fractional gopher. Fractional CTOs are all the rage these days. I'm not that, I'm a fractional gopher. I, I work for different clients. You can hire me if you want some help with your Go. Uh, I also do Go mentoring and career mentoring. Hire me. Um, I'm also the co-organizer of the Go Amsterdam uh, meetup. And I'm a podcast host and YouTuber. I hate that word, but I, I put videos on YouTube, so I am one. Um, so some of you may know me through the Cup of Go podcasting listeners here in the room today. All right. Couple. I hope there's a lot more after this. I have, I have stickers, by the way. They'll be over there. If you like Brewster, our, our little uh, gopher mascot for the Cup of Go podcast, get a sticker for your laptop a little bit later. So, <clears throat> how did I become a contributor? Well, first, I needed an idea. Um, so long ago, uh, I wrote this public open source library called Kivik. It's for CouchDB. It's sort of like database SQL, uh, but for CouchDB. So if you want to do document store stuff. Um, and I had a, a request from a user of my library. Uh, they were trying to send a regular expression as JSON uh, to CouchDB because it's a JSON store. And it was just submitting an empty um, object rather than meaningful data. So they said, hey, could you make your library do this thing the right way, you know, and send a, a regular expression string? I was like, that's a really great request, but I don't feel like it's my library's responsibility to do that. That should go in the standard library. So. Uh, I created a, a request, which we'll talk about. But first, here's the problem they were explaining. So here's the code. This is, I think this is the only slide in the presentation with code. Uh, so imagine you have this regular expression, foo question mark, so it would match F-O or F-O-O, -O. pretty simple. Um, and you, you call JSON Marshall on something that contains that. This is the output you would get. Not very useful. This is the output the, u the, the user of my library wanted and what I thought made sense. So I created a proposal on the Go issue tracker on GitHub. Now this is a great point to mention that there is a process, and a proposal process. Some of you are probably familiar. If you listen to the Go uh, podcast I just mentioned a couple ago, we talk about proposals fairly frequently. Uh, and we talk about, oh, this one's in the accept phase, or this one's been uh, declined, or this one is possibly accepted, and so on. That that's all relates to this. Um, now this is a very simple proposal, so it didn't need the design doc, which some do, like generics had a design doc, actually multiple design docs in the end. Um, so this is a very simple proposal. I mean, I just explained it to you. I, I don't need a design doc to explain what I just explained on the last slide. So this didn't need that. So I just created a little, you can see there, that's, that's the entire issue there, right? Um, that's what I wanted. I showed the code that I just showed you. I showed the current behavior, the expected behavior, and a little bit of conversation about my reasoning. Uh, and so that happened in... Uh, 2021, May 13, if I can read that correctly. Uh, and then that, that kicked off this proposal process, or, or a truncated miniature version of it anyway. 
Uh, so we had some discussion. Um, the f one of the first comments came from Daniel Marti, who said this would also be useful for this other thing, and, and tagged uh, Joe Tsai, uh, who was working on another issue that it would be relevant to. Um, I, got an, uh, I don't know who this, I don't know this person's name, but I didn't look it up, but um, they said uh, losing, the option f uh, losing the options feels like a deal breaker. What that was referring to, there's actually two flags you can put on a regular expression in, in the Go library. You can say it's a POSIX regular expression, and you can say it's, is it longest, longest match? Uh, so they have these two Boolean flags you can set on a regular expression, and those are not expressed when you call the dot string method on the regular expression. So those flags would be lost. And so this person said that feels like a deal breaker. And uh, there were some other comments too, but ultimately uh, Russ Cox came in and said on June 9, so this is almost two months later, said it looks like this is probably going to be declined um, based on the fact that we'd be, it would be a lossy exp expression of the regular expression. Um, that was sad. <laughs> Not really sad, because this isn't a feature I wanted. I just was kind of excited to see a feature I proposed, you know, get, get through the process. Um, and then uh, Roger Pepe, I think is his name, uh, came in and said, I think it would be fine if we went ahead and did this. Uh, you know, just use the equivalent of string. It's already lossy. Why don't we just go with that? And so on. Gave his reasoning. Um, and so the, this is just a month later now. We're into July 2021. Russ says, uh, so this is the current idea. We're going to have Marshall and unmarshall do exactly the same thing that string does, blah, blah, blah. And then it looks like it's going to be likely accept now. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> Happy about that. Fingers crossed. Let's see if it really becomes accepted. Um, <clears throat> a week later, no change in uh, consensus, so it became accepted. Yay! So who's going to do the work? <laughs> S sadly, uh, just having your proposal accepted in Go doesn't mean it's done. You know, someone has to actually do the work. Now, this isn't a lot of work. In fact, Russ said, even before it was accepted, I'll do the implementation and see if I come, into, come up with anything surprising. Uh, I don't know if he ever did. If he did, he never mentioned it on the issue tracker. Uh, if, I, if I ever had the chance to interview him, I'm going to ask him, did you ever do that thing? Um, so I said, uh, January, this is six months after it was accepted, I said, I'm interested in working on this. And nobody really responded except somebody gave me a heart emoji. So I, I felt good, but... You know. <laughs> and then uh, three months later, four months later, uh, Joe Sai says, uh, Hey, are you uh, going to do this, Russ? <laughs> I, I can actually use it now. And crickets from Russ. I mean, I, he's a busy guy. No, no, no shame on him. But, you know, so more waiting ensues. <clears throat> so uh, I decided I was going to go ahead and do it. Uh, and, I, and I decided to, I don't remember exactly when. We'll see the dates in a few moments. But so I decided to go ahead and do the code. Now, this is a good time to talk about the contribution guide. This is probably the part, at least I felt, was the scariest part of contributing to Go. So uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about it. Uh, but the TLDR is you have to create a Google account. You probably already have one, unless you're intentional about not having one uh, for security or ethical reasons or whatever. Um, if you want to contribute to Go, you have to have one. I'm sorry to say. So you know, if, if you're avoiding that bandwagon for ethical reasons, maybe Go contribution isn't for you. I understand your reasons, but you have to have a Google account. You have to uh, set it up uh, a Garrett account with a Google account. What's Garrett? Who, who's used Garrett? I'm curious. Well, who, who doesn't even know what the word means? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so think of like GitHub, except an open, like, it looks like a, a, an open source version of GitHub from like 1992. That's what it looks like. <laughs> but it's really powerful in ways that I can't really comprehend or explain because I haven't used it that much. But it's not bad, so don't, don't be afraid of it. <laughs> Uh, but you need, they use Garrett for that. Now, I, actually, I lied a little bit. They do use Garrett for that. But you can do this through GitHub also. Uh, and I've not done that process. But if you're really afraid of Garrett and you can't read the documentation and follow the instructions, you can also use a, create a GitHub pull request. So that's an option open to you if you're really afraid of this. But don't be. It's not that bad. So 11 months later, I finally wrote the code. I created my Google account and all that stuff and the Garrett account. And I wrote the code. This, this is my change set. This is what I added to the standard library plus some tests and a couple other metadata things. It, it's like 20 lines of code if you count the comments in the blank space, you know, the blank lines. You know, that's not a big deal. I was really hurt, though, that Marcia didn't mention this in the Go 121 changes, because... <laughs> 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 I know it flew up, just barely flew under your radar. <laughs> I actually this yesterday evening because of time limits. Oh, yes. 
Yes, okay. Uh, and, and you knew I was going to talk about it, so uh, you know, why mention it twice? So, um, yeah, really simple. I, I guess I lied. There's two slides of, of code, but uh, it calls the string method and turns it into a byte slice. That's all it does to marshal, to, to, to marshal your, your regular expression. And then to unmarshal it, it does the same thing in reverse with an extra uh, error check. Super simple code. Uh, so I push that up, and uh, then I, this is a screenshot of Garrett, by the way. Like I said, 1992 GitHub. That's what it looks like. <coughs> um, and I got some code review. And then it was time for some humility. I, I kind of pride myself in writing tests and writing good tests. I usually write them before my code. <coughs> First comment, make sure the tests pass. <laughs> I uh, failed to, I mean, I, I tested my code, but I didn't run the entire test suite, which takes 10 minutes or something on my machine, um, and it was failing. Uh, the reason it was failing is because I f failed to add some metadata about public API changes. It wasn't a big deal. It was easy to fix, but it made me feel a little bit silly for, like, not writing, or not running the test suite before I asked other people to waste their time reviewing my code. I had to learn the project style. Uh, this was my original commit message. I don't see anything particularly wrong with it, but it wasn't the style that they wanted. They wanted something much shorter. They didn't want me to, they didn't want a long paragraph explaining, like they felt like, I, I say they, Ian, felt like add these functions was enough. I didn't need a paragraph explanation. So, you know, I, I followed his style guide and ended up with something shorter. Um, the tests, wanted, he wanted some changes in the tests. I called t.fatal. Uh, but it was, in a, it was in a for loop, so you know, if one test failed, the other test wouldn't run, so he wanted me to do t.error instead. Um, cool. Makes sense. And then uh, Godoc recently, I don't know how recently, recently in my, in my mind, because I used it before this, but they recently added these square brackets to do like hyperlinks and stuff, and I didn't do that, so I needed to add that. Um, yeah, little nitpicky things. Plus, I forgot to run the test. That, that <laughs> That, that was kind of it. <laughs> uh, so that, that was my, uh, my, uh, my thing. Um, it got mer merged uh, on March 27, so just over two years after the original, is that right? No, a little, just under two years after the original uh, issue was opened, it got merged. And then it was in the Go121. Yay! Uh, my name's not there. It's in, <laughs> it's, it's in Git somewhere, but yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> Uh, it still felt good. Um, so I think I just breezed through that. I have a lot of time here. We have time for questions here. I mean, I have a few more slides, but um, this is the point of my talk, really. What does it take to become a Go contributor, and what does it not take? So non-requirements are you don't need mad hacker skills. I mean, you saw the simplicity of that code I wrote. Now, I've, I've written much more complicated code, at least I like to think so, but not at the Go project. Uh, I've, I've spoken to people who can contribute to Go just by adding those square braces to GoDoc. <laughs> that's cool. That helps. I mean, that's valuable, right? It's not, it's not cheating. Uh, that gives me hyperlinks. When I go to the GoDoc for that package, I can click on a hyperlink now. That's useful. So if that's what you want to do to contribute to Go, that's all you need to do. All you need to know is how to type square brackets. You don't need to know about zombie Go routines and whatnot. You don't need deep Go knowledge. What do you need to be a Go contributor? Uh, I think the main thing I learned from this process is that for me to be a Go contributor, I need patience. Uh, it, I mean, a, a lot of that wall clock time was me not doing anything. If I had been trying and, and pushing the, the process forward, I probably could have truncated that down to maybe three or four months. <laughs> but that's a long time to get 20 lines of code in, implemented, I think. I mean, relative to what I do at my day job anyway, where you know, I do that 15 times a day or something. So it takes patience. Um, but if you're willing to put in the time, uh, you can become a good contributor. It takes a little humility, uh, especially when it comes to learning a new project's style. I mean, I don't know if you've contributed to other open source projects before. I, I have. Each one has their own flavor, their own style. You need to learn that. You need to be willing to learn that uh, and, and not, uh, you know, just put your ego on the side. That's not the point. The point is to do something useful according to the community's guidelines and to learn some new things. Um, yeah, I think I've breezed through this. Those of you who uh, raised your hand that you were intimidated earlier, any of you feel less intimidated now? One, two, three, okay, I, my talk was a success. 
<laughs> that was my goal. Um, if you're interested in learning other ways, you just, um, one, of, one of my goals is to make Go less scary for people. Um, that's part of the Cup of Go podcast uh, idea where we talk about the weekly Go news. Um, it's part of my YouTube channel, Boldly Go, if you want to watch that. Um, if you have questions, reach out. Um, you can find me at boldlygo.tech. That's my Go-themed website. You can con find all my socials and contact details there. Um, any questions? I don't know. Do we, do we have? Do we, we can do questions, right? We have uh, enough time for questions. We have time, so yeah. I will hand you the microphone. If you're too far away, you'll have to shout, and he has to repeat. Hi, thanks yeah. for for your talk. I'm one of the couple go listeners. So Wonderful, <laughs> thanks. Shout out to the podcast. Um, my question is: Are there other ways to become a go contributor, like I don't know, good first issues or stuff in GitHub? Um, like uh, uh, other ways, other than in Introducing a proposal? Yes, definitely. Uh, you could find one of the existing bug fixes or proposals. So uh, th this, was, this was the first code I wrote that was implemented into Go. I'd, I had participated in the sense of filing bug reports and stuff like that previously that others then fixed. Uh, and, and many that had been just like closed as invalid or something. That happens too. There, there's that humility part that comes in. But yes, there are a lot of open issues. There are some tagged as good first issues. Um, you can find typo fixes. Ty typo. Uh, I actually have an open uh, CL. That's the Garrett terminology for a PR. Uh, open for a, a documentation fix in a pack package of the center library. You know, so things like that. There's a lot of things you can do. You don't need to file either a bug report or a feature request. You can find one that's already there. Hello. Thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, I've tried uh, several times uh, during Oktoberfest to, to do some contribution. And the, the, big, uh, the big part of it was to find an, an easy issue to begin with. Do you have some tips for that? Not really. I mean, uh, that, so there, there is a, I, I believe there's a tag on GitHub on the issue tracker for like good first issue or needs, there's, I know there's a needs help. You could look at that. I think there's a good first issue, but I might be confusing that with a different project. Um, one, one thing that, um, uh, is understandable but frustrating to me about the Go project is it's not really designed for newcomers. Uh, that, that's one thing I hope to help change with this, you know, help at least lower the mental barrier that you might have individually uh, to doing this. But it, I say it's understandable because, you know, they're trying to build a professional quality, high quality uh, language and standard library. Uh, and that's, that requires one set of skills and, and guardrails around the project. Being open to all new contributors is a different one, and it requires very different types of open source management. So Go, I think, mostly intentionally has moved to that side of, of high barrier to entry <laughs> for, for re reasonably good reasons, but that is frustrating in this, for this question. Like, how do you find something you can do to contribute? I don't really have a great answer except look through the issue tracker and find something. In front. Become a Fotham organizer, get fitness for free. <laughs> yeah, hello. Hi. Uh, so you had this requirement at the beginning, and this uh, sparked uh, the, the problem and, and the solution in the, in the library. But what, what did you do in the meanwhile? Because this took three years, right? Yeah. I, I, so the, the what did I do about this in the two years interceding between issue file and I, I didn't do anything, honestly. <laughs> the, the person using the library, uh, I'm assuming they had their own workaround. I mean, so there, there are workarounds for this sort of thing. Like, so, so suppose that you want to, suppose this already exists. Now you're using Go 122, but you want a different version of the regular expression to be presented. You have the same problem, right? So you probably would end up wrapping the regular expression regex.regeps type and put your own custom marshal on it, for example. That's probably what they were doing. Um, I do that with time.time .time or time.duration fairly frequently, depending on the application needs. So that's probably what I would do. Are there any differences in the main Go code versus like the Go X uh, modules? The, what's the difference between the Go center library and the, the X? Go, go, is it golang.org slash X? Yeah. Um, barrier to entry or something like that. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I haven't contributed to the X stuff, so I don't, 
I don't have experience to go on from there. I think it's pretty much the same process, though. Uh, I, I do think the re requirements for inclusion in the X packages are lower. So if you, if you want to add, a, say, something to X slices, you want to add, I don't know, change color or something, you know, some ridiculous thing there, there's lower barrier to entry to get in, get in there because it's considered experimental. So like, if you want to do it in the center library, they, they, want, they have a high standard. Like, we want to make sure that we're never going to regret doing this. <laughs> Uh, in the experimental, they're like, yeah, we don't know if it's a good idea, but let's try it. So in that sense, it's easier, lower barrier to entry. Yeah. Any last questions? Okay. I think this can mean one thing. It was an amazing talk with not too many questions left. Round of applause, everyone.